Hello, everybody. So uh, we will start our session here on hardwood, and I would like to introduce you the, the gentleman who will uh, drive the show for this afternoon, it's Mr. Francois Robichaud, uh, eminent expert from uh, FP Innovation, our research center. So Francois has worked on different issues on market and marketing, and uh, he he's also an expert in different fields in the lumber industry. So Francois will introduce our speaker and do some uh, organization for this uh, session. Francois, please. I, I, I need it. I will start with, uh, so welcome everyone to Montreal. Welcome to this uh, conference. Um, I will start with a few words in French, just to tell people that there won't, won't be much words in French. <laughs> Bonjour, bienvenue à Montréal. Je m'adresse en français à ceux qui ne parlent pas anglais. Alors, la conférence aujourd'hui va se dérouler euh, strictement en anglais, mais si jamais vous avez des questions ou euh, vous avez euh, des fois des, des besoins en traduction, ben je n'ai pas pour demander euh, soit à Bruno Couture. Bruno, est-ce que tu veux te lever? Bruno Couture, qui est directeur du secteur des bois feuillés au QWeb, ou encore vous adresser à moi, ça nous fera plaisir de traduire. Now back to, to English. We haven't said anything that would hurt you. Um, I, was, I, was, I was scared when they asked me to moderate this conference. I told QWeb that I, I'm famous at forgetting names. So I said I will be standing up there and I will forget the speaker's name. So they said, we'll figure that out. We'll send you over two Michaels. So you can't go wrong. So with those two Michaels uh, at end, I'm very pleased to, uh, <coughs> to introduce this conference because uh, if you are coming from the hardwood industry, then you're probably uh, a survivor. Uh, the, the past 10 years, or at least the past seven years in the hardwood industry have been very tough and the world has changed. So uh, we used to look at Asia for uh, exports all over the world. Now we look at Asia for its domestic markets as well. We, look to look, we used to look at Asia for China only. Now other markets are picking up in China. We see lots and lots of uh, phytosanitary or health-related issues uh, that are changing the way we trade lumber around the world. I'm sure our two speakers will talk about that. Uh, the environmental footprint and uh, traceability of wood uh, could have been called a dream of uh, green people 15 years ago, but now you speak to seasoned trader and it's part of the daily life. So, so the world has really changed for hardwood. Um, and lastly, uh, we used to look at hardwoods because it's a very nice looking product. So you know, the color, the grain, the species, but now some nasty people look at hardwoods for carbon and energy. So, so basically the way we look at hardwood has been changing. And I'm glad to, uh, to be here to introduce these two speakers. So we'll start with Mr. and I can't go wrong, I will call him Mike because we've known each other for about 10 minutes so I can go for more familiar uh, introduction. Um, Mike has been working with, and he has led also the Hardwood Publishing Company for over 30 years. Uh, and Mike uh, has been uh, a Norton editor and uh, he analyzes domestic and export markets for Norton hardwood species, uh, all the way from the sawmill through the supply chain to the secondary and end users. Um, bear with me, he has been involved in several magazines and I'm, I'm, I, I won't screw them. Uh, he's been working for the weekly hardwood review, the hardwood review export, the hardwood leader, and hardwood publishing's newest offering, the hardwood review e-global. So no doubt, Mike has been very instrumental in developing woodlogics.com, which is uh, Hardwoods Publishing Online, full service market research and buyer seller service. And he's also responsible for serving customer sprint and online advertising needs. So Mike, if you can uh, come over. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon, how's everybody doing? I'm going to start off with a couple uh, shameless plugs. Uh, he mentioned our publications. Uh, as you can see in the middle right there is the uh, weekly hardwood review, and that is our uh, first publication that we started 30 years ago. Uh, in that, we uh, 
survey the lumber markets all across North America and report the prices that we are seeing in the marketplace. Uh, these are historical prices of green kiln dried uh, lumber. We also have a market commentary section as well as an editorial section in each week's issue. Then we also have our monthly publication, the Hardwood Review Global. That goes to about uh, over 70 foreign countries. And then we have a middle of the month publication that is emailed. It's a PDF called the Hardwood Leader. That is for more of the executive. It's a very quick read. Gives them a good insight into what's gone on and what we predict will be going on. So that's the only publication that we actually do some forecasting. And then this is our uh, newest, which we started about a year ago in partnership with uh, AHEC. Um, and this uh, is an emailed publication. It goes to three different regions, it goes to the Far East, goes to Latin America, goes to Europe. Uh, Europe is just in English. Um, the Latin American version goes in English and Spanish, and the uh, Far Eastern version is emailed in Mandarin as well as English. So that's, uh, that's my shameless plug, and we'll get right into, there's the website uh, that he also mentioned, WoodLogics. So I'm kind of kind of depart from traditional presentation and, and not go over species in depth or anything like that. And I'm going to kind of look at five major market drivers that we're going to watch through the year of 2016. Uh, we don't have the answers to all these things and how the year will shake out, but we have some clues from the past uh, and how these drivers might impact the markets for the coming year. So looking back on uh, 2015, this is kind of a recap. We had uh, strong domestic demand. Uh, exports fell slightly, but the overall market was in pretty good shape. Uh, so they were down a little bit from 2014, which were are some, some of our record highs. Let's look at our outlook on 2016. We still see... Uh, domestic demand is decent, maybe not quite as uh, robust as, as last year. Uh, exports are going to uh, trend down slightly uh, in our opinion. So overall, the year of 2016, we think it'll be flat overall. So one of the first, one of the five things we're going to watch, and this is Mike Snow's big area, I'm just going to touch on it a little bit because uh, China is such a big part of what we do, so we're going to look at China a little bit. So exports were very, uh, were very good in 2015, which, to which totals just slightly behind 2014, which were an all-time record uh, in Asia and Latin America as well. So you can see uh, 2015 there was in Asia was just slightly below the prior year. And uh, Latin America, it uh, was almost equal. And Europe, as we expected, it was down. Now, why are exports worth talking about as a key driver of the hardwood markets? 41% of the hardwood grade lumber sawn in the U.S. ends up in foreign markets. That probably could even be closer to 50%. Why do we focus so much on China? 46% of U.S. hardwood exports went to China in 2014. Uh, in 2015, 47% uh, went to China, and that was through November, the last month that we had there. So that means one in every five uh, grade lumber boards cut is, is destined for China. So that's a big market. China is the first or second largest export market for every U.S. Uh, hardwood species but birch. Uh, for the top four, if you look, China accounts for more than two-thirds of all U.S. exports, and China's market share grew in 2015 for all those items. So as you can see, China is extremely important across the board. So we'll look at uh, red oak as an example of one. Export volumes and trends are also important to watch because they're increasingly correlated with lumber prices. We can argue uh, whether exports drive prices or prices drive exports, and it varies by species. But the relationship between the two is very strong for some species, including red oak.
Now let's look at the trends and uh, uh, exports to China. So 2014 was a record year for U.S. exports to China, and 2015 totals were just 5% lower, despite relatively slow first half of the year shipments. And the next, uh, this slide and the next, anything shown in red will represent a record all-time high. So if we look at the monthly trend, now this is where we should really pay attention to this or the trends that you see on exports heading to China because those trends tend to repeat themselves over and over. As you can see, in 2013, we have a summer lull. Things pick up October, uh, September, October, November. Again, September, October, November. This year, again, September, October, November. What's interesting you're going to see here is December is usually a slow month depending upon the timing of the Chinese New Year. So last year, we didn't see a huge drop off, but this year we saw a tremendous drop off. And then surprisingly, January of 2016, exports were up pretty substantial. So as you can see what I was talking about there, the, the record was in 2014, 2015 was just slightly below. Now, if you take January and December and you average those out, even though we had a great January of 2016, you average December, January, things are actually lower in 2016 than they were last year. So that is something to keep in mind that if this trend continues, uh, we could see some slower exports. So back to Red Oak and exports to China, uh, shipments to Red Oak uh, reached an all-time high in 2015, which is a very good thing, but only after a very slow start to the year, which we can see in the monthly volumes. So as you can see, Red Oak exports to China really grew in 2013. They were up 50%. 2014, they were up 19%. And then things did slow down quite a bit uh, last year, and it was up only 7%. But if you look, we had the largest month of all time uh, in September of last year. Yes. No, that's just rough sawn lumber. Okay, okay this is, I'm going to real quick go over ash because this really doesn't pertain to you all, but it uh, gives you an idea. But we, we look and we see a similar pattern with ash. So overall, exports to China... Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go over every species, but you can see here at a glance that shipments of red oak, um, cherry, walnut, um, ash, white oak, poplar, and hickory. Uh, we had record years for red oak, cherry, and walnut, surprising with cherry because uh, it's kind of been the uh, red-headed stepchild as of late. Nobody really wants it around and nobody can move it. But it actually did have a record year, and if you look, the record months uh, came in uh, the uh, end of the third quarter or fourth quarter of 2015. So the 2016 drivers. Things in red, as I said, uh, the, these are now kind of a negative. Uh, China, we've got uh, some headwinds, so we've got a slowing economy in China. We don't know by how much. The government's forecasting somewhere in the 65 to 7% growth, which is great for us, but for China, they're used to the 10% plus growth rate. Uh, their housing market is, is slowing. Uh, their currency is weakening compared to the U.S. dollar. Uh, and we saw a heavy fall purchasing, uh, which made lead to another sleepy spring. So as when we, uh, as I mentioned, when we combined December and January, January of this year, things didn't look quite so rosy, but it's going to be interesting to see the February and March numbers uh, for overall exports and see how that comes into play. So the strong U.S. dollar comes into play. That's uh, important to you all uh, here in Canada. If you're shipping back into the U.S., that's been a benefit for you. 
Uh, I do have quite a few customers that we talk to uh, that have uh, seen pretty good sales back into the states uh, with fairly good margins on their side. And then Europe, uh, it's kind of a wreck. Um, lackluster economic growth at best, weak euro. And then the one positive we do have right now are low shipping costs. So that is a positive for us right now. So the second thing we're going to watch is, is housing. And this is the U.S. markets. Now, I'm sure you all are aware we get great headlines in the U.S. on our housing market. But when you start digging into those numbers, a lot of times they're not quite as rosy as everybody makes them out to be. So uh, they go back and uh, always re revise them down for the previous months. Uh, and when they do that, they don't make any kind of uh, uh, headline, uh, but they're usually uh, a lot less uh, stellar than they made it out to be uh, a couple months previous to that. So the uh, industry associations in the business are making the housing markets look strong. So uh, the National Association of Home Builders uh, and the National Association of Realtors, they both are there to sell houses. So they're going to make sure that their numbers uh, try to represent a robust and healthy housing market. So the census new home sales estimates are almost always revised down, as I said just a few minutes ago, uh, which makes the current month look better. Uh, and the picture is uh, uh, persistently rosier uh, by doing that. But let's look at uh, the annual growth in, in new home starts and existing home sales in the U.S. So uh, new home starts in 2012 were up... Uh, uh, 24%, 2013, 15, 2014, 5%. Then when we look at 2015, it was forecasted. Uh, this is the National Association of Home Builders that uh, did this forecast. Forecast for 15, the actual was 9.3. Now they're forecasting 27% in 2016. There's no way we're going to come to the, close to that number. But if you look at the existing home sales, the National Association of Realtors, we feel like they're maybe a little, little more honest in their numbers. And in fact, in 2015, you can see there they forecasted 7% and hit it almost on the nose at 7.1. And they're forecasting existing home sales to uh, grow by 3% in 2016. So housing markets uh, will do well to grow at half the pace of what they're uh, forecasting, and that would be generous, and we're actually thinking they'll be in the 5 to 7% range for new home starts and new home sales. And we uh, think existing home sales should fall in that 3% uh, range. But keep in mind, the median single-family home sales price uh, is mentioned all the time, and this is not necessarily a, uh, a great uh, thing for us. Um, in and um, amongst itself, it's not good indicators of housing strength, and the reason being, if you look at uh, 2002, you look at houses over 500,000, made up a very, very small portion. Let's see, that was... Uh, to the start, let's say starter homes uh, below 200, that was 55%. So the blue line in 2002, that was 55% of all new home sales in the United States. Uh, today, it's just 20%. So as we see growth in the 500,000 range, and this is a great market for hardwood products when you're talking flooring, cabinets, new furniture that's going to go into these homes, that's kind of been somewhat of a bright spot for us. But it's still not a huge market overall. So as we can see, back in 2002, it was just 9%. Today, it's 27% of the overall market. So the new home sales price here, 
kind of what I was talking about, the median and the uh, average, um, that number is not a great indicator. Uh, we need to uh, really focus, you know, we've had good growth in the, in the 500,000 plus, but since growth in the other ranges have been stagnant, uh, they also do consume some hardwood products in, in cabinetry and some flooring like in foyers, uh, things like that. Uh, that's been very lackluster and we do need some recovery there to help us out. So 43% of the growth in new home sales since 2011 have been homes over $400,000. Annual sales of homes under $200,000 have contracted another 18% since 2011. Barring sustained stock market woes, high-end housing should continue to do well in 2016. Again, we're not excited about growth in the low and middle end uh, ends and why again uh, that has to do with the job markets. So when you're dealing with the U.S. job markets, again, like all the, uh, the housing numbers, we get great headlines all the time. This is from the New York Times in December. Robust hiring in December capped solid year for U.S. jobs. So uh, job markets rarely, if never, are as strong as the headlines want us to believe. Headline figures are seasonally adjusted just as the housing are, uh, and those adjustment calculations change monthly. Labor force manipulation masks true unemployment or underemployment. They don't take into account the quality of jobs. It's not, that's not considered. Wage growth and household income is actually down, and people with two jobs are actually counted twice in the U.S. So if you, you have two different ways you look at the uh, employment numbers in the U.S., the current employment survey counts payroll jobs. Again, persons employed by two different companies are counted twice, and that's used to calculate the monthly job gains, seasonally adjusted. But if you look at the current population survey, that counts employed people, and that's used to uh, uh, calculate the actual unemployment rate. So if you look at uh, December, and they're saying we had from the uh, em uh, employment number, we had growth of 292,000 jobs. But if you look at the unadjusted number of the population survey, we had 63,000 people with fewer uh, the fewer uh, unemployed people. So if you look at where the job growth was in, in that big number, it was in the 16 to 24 in December. Well, those are kids that are home from college and they're working part-time jobs and they're counted in there. But then if you look in the critical area, the 25 to 64 was down 243,000 jobs and 65 uh, year old and uh, older, it was down 55,000 jobs. So December plus young people ex uh, equals your temporary seasonal jobs. So now you take these numbers here and you look at the increase in population. Now that can be immigrants or people aging into the actual labor force. We actually had lost jobs of 243, so now we have new unemployed of 310,000 people. So take 10% of that, add it to the unemployment, you have that. So actually dropped from the labor force is 278,000 people. So the way the government looks at it is if somebody hasn't been actively looking after four weeks, they're just dropped altogether from this. So the status of non-working people aged 25 to 64. And as you can see, our unemployment rate now, which they're touting the Obama administration, is down at 4%. But look at the growth of the number of people that are not in the labor force. It's grown considerably. So labor force participation, uh, and this is since 2009. Uh, you look at it, we had almost 80% uh, there, and now it's down to uh, 70, a little below 77%. So labor force participation in the critical ages of 25 to 64 has decreased. 
So the U.S. real median household income, this was at the high point in 1999. And it's gone down ever since then. So the good news, employment for working age Americans has been growing faster than the population since 2010. Though more jobs are in the service sector are part time. The bad news, we'd need to put 5.5 million people back to work today just to return to the working age class uh, employment levels of 10 years ago. Not sufficient job or wage growth to sustain stronger housing markets. So that all ties into uh, the construction of the lower end uh, uh, price points in the housing market. Now we'll talk a little bit, uh, number four, the rising imports coming in. And as you can see here uh, in the uh, furniture market, and we all know what happened to the furniture market in the U.S., and the domestic market has shrunk considerably. Imports uh, have risen dramatically. And here's a market that uh, everybody said China could not compete in. And this is the cabinet industry. Everybody said there's no way that the Chinese can compete with the timelines uh, that people look for to get a, a new kitchen done for the remodel. Uh, but China has figured out how to do it. And they do it a number of ways, uh, but they are also setting up uh, warehouses here in the U.S. where they ship the, uh, the knockdown boxes over uh, and the drawer fronts and doors, and they can actually put together a semi-custom kitchen and do it in the same time frame that uh, cabinet manufacturers in the U.S. and Canada can do. Canada was a huge, huge part of this in supplying cabinets to the U.S. markets and their market share is uh, still continuing to grow, but it's eroding against the Chinese. Now, if you look at flooring, everybody said kind of the same thing about flooring when you're first talking about furniture. It didn't have enough value for the Chinese to take on, but apparently it did. So if you look at it between solid and engineered flooring from 2008, to where we are today, this is projected for 2015. These are in million square feet, so we're approaching a billion uh, square feet of flooring that's being imported. And China's accounting for 74% of that. Again, this is hurting the Canadian manufacturers because they're having to compete with these Chinese manufacturers. So this is very interesting. The um, misclassification of a lot of the flooring uh, coming into the U.S., the Chinese used to uh, hide a lot of that uh, under plywood and other products. Uh, and then they changed the tariff schedules in 2013 to try to capture more of that. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the import share uh, grew dramatically, uh, and if you look at 2015, quite high. So the strengthening uh, U.S. dollar uh, comes into play for you all uh, selling on the world markets and selling back into the U.S. Uh, can be a benefit uh, for the United States. It's tough going. We're going to see more import pressure coming into the U.S., uh, and then uh, the strength of the dollar against the euro is going to make... Uh, sales into Europe even, uh, even more difficult. So rising finished good imports are not a direct impact on U.S. lumber producer. Indirect impacts, it, it hurts domestic customers, requires more export volume uh, to make up for it. Uh, again, thinking about the furniture exodus, the firming U.S. dollar will accelerate imports uh, again in 2016. Now, this is really important when you're dealing with is your low-grade market. 60% of that log is going into the low-grade components. In 2015, we saw strip flooring and uh, flooring oak prices collapse. Frame stock uh, prices softened, can't soften, board roads softened, crane mats softened. Uh, we saw a slight year-end increase, kind of an anomaly, uh, allowed tile prices to soften despite strong demand. We've had very good demand from uh, the railroads, 
But here in Canada, keep in mind, the board road and the crane mats are very important. Um, but with the softening of the oil market, demand for those products are going down. So as you can see, these are prices for these low-grade components uh, from 06 through 2013. And uh, you can see there what's happened to the uh, red oak, the flooring oak, where you can see the prices have really fallen off. We're starting to see some come back right now. And you can see the, cross, the strength of the cross ties. So a lot of the mills are cutting cross ties at this point. And there's your high point right there for your uh, uh, red oak and your uh, frame stock. And there's your high point for cross ties. So in 2016, oil prices look to be down long term. So um, again, crane mats are going to be a problem. Right now, there are uh, 500,000 crane mats needed for two proposed Texas projects. But we've seen uh, almost 1,300 oil rigs shut down in the U.S. and Canada in 2015. Uh, hardwoods will struggle to uh, maintain a share of the pallet and frame stock markets as some al alternative, uh, alternative uh, items come on the market. Tie inventories are building into 2016. So production of ties, uh, and this is according to the Railroad Tie Association, production was up 35% uh, from November of 2014 through 2015. Uh, overall rail traffic's down 2.5% in 2015, and that's uh, due to lower coal and crude oil hauls. So ties are a very, very big component uh, of that 60%. Uh, uh, and as you can see, inventories have been growing considerably. Uh, production, the brakes have been put on to a certain extent, but we have seen the inventory uh, grow considerably there. So everything uh, seems to hang on whether tie market stays strong enough to absorb the high production. Low grade markets will worsen if decent grade lumber markets encourage higher sawmill production. So just to kind of recap everything there, uh, again 2016 looks flat on the whole. Exports will be down. Uh, could see a slow start. We're not, uh, I'm not going to take that at face value after what January's numbers were, but let's see what uh, February and March do. Domestic demand will grow, but not like in 2015. Again, that's held back by slower housing growth, lackluster jobs, election uncertainties, market worries, et cetera. Imports will continue to be a uh, challenge for, for everybody in the domestic markets, and we'll see some weakening in the low-grade markets uh, and that's where a lot of the profit comes from for hardwood mills. So that's, uh, that's my take on the market uh, looking into 2016. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Don't You're welcome. Go, don't go too far because I'm sure the crowd is uh, waiting for a few questions. Yes. So I will have at least one for you. Okay. you you've talked, Mike, about a lot... Um, uh, some industries like furniture who have been offshored uh, to China, uh, even the kitchen cabinet industries now experiencing this. In your trade or uh, industry, do you see some of, uh, reshoring uh, occurring? We do. We do see some uh, companies coming back because of the rise in uh, wages that we're seeing in China. Or uh, some companies are actually looking for other markets where they do have cheaper uh, wage bases such as Vietnam and then we see the emergence of India as well. So we do see some coming back uh, to the U.S. but we also see uh, some of the manufacturing going to some of the other uh, markets uh, that are expanding. Thank you. And I will have another one with uh, Eastern Canadian eyes. Uh, the importance of the downfall or the lower grade uh, in hardwood can be very, very high. Uh, how do you feel about the, uh, the, the markets for these lower grade hardwoods uh, looking into 2016? Well, again, uh, most of that deals with the railroad tie market. And again, we're seeing a building of inventories of railroad ties at this point. Uh, 
Uh, so that's going to be a, a big driver in this. Uh, the red oak flooring market's been kind of surprising, the strength in that. So again, that uh, ties directly into home, new home construction and remodeling. Uh, so if that market uh, surprises us and stays rather robust, we'll see some good uh, demand there for 2 and 3A red oak. And then uh, depending upon what the railroads do, that's going to be a big part of it. Thank you. So, oh yes, we have a question here. Well, no, there is, and, and uh, I should have put that slide in there, and I can actually, if anybody wants it, I can put it in. It's, it's not a major, major species that's going over there, um, but uh, there has been some growth and some upper-grade hard maple going over, um, but again, it's, uh, when you look at the whole scheme of things, it's, it's a very minor species as far as that goes. We've had great demand, you know, obviously here for, for our white woods uh, as of late, uh, especially soft maple. Uh, soft maple looks like it might continue to be really strong and hard maple we'll see. I did see uh, some pricing pushback over the last few weeks on hard maple so keep that in mind there that there is some pricing pushback on uh, on some of the species coming. Thank you. So with that I will uh, don't don't go, go away as of yet. Uh, we, need, we want to thank you. I will uh, invite Mr. Nicolas Aubert. Is Nicolas around? Yes, to uh, present you with a token of our appreciation thank for you. your great presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.